So I, I told you in, the, in my presentation uh, about one kind of interaction that I had with, with Peter Jackson. Uh, and I also briefly mentioned that a lot of uh, the time I spent with Peter was uh, developing course materials and teaching that course materials. And it, uh, just after Peter arrived, we transformed significantly, after the three of you graduated, we transformed greatly the, the way we taught what we taught. And this all came about through the interaction with our next speaker, John Jenner. John uh, is a Cornell grad, graduated uh, in the, uh, our option of the old uh, Sibley School program, and uh, he was in the class of 1957, but as you may recall, at that time the engineering program was five years in length, so he got his degree a year later, and uh, then the year after that he got his MBA degree. John also played on the Cornell basketball team, so I, I think John probably had a good time when he was a student. Uh, so, but it was in the early 1980s that I met John. I was, uh, at the time, the, the director of the Cornell Manufacturing, Engineering, and Productivity Program, uh, a program we put in place in response to the uh, almost, uh, well, un unbelievable hollowing out of American manufacturing, largely due to the, uh, well, two factors, uh, the exchange rate with Japan, which was 240 plus yen to the dollar at the time. So it was virtually impossible to make anything in the United States uh, because of the, uh, the cost difference, at least <coughs> as it was, uh, as it was uh, expressed in the exchange rate. So IBM, where John worked at the time, was interested in trying to promote education in manufacturing. So we, there was a meeting uh, in New York City that I went to, and by happenstance, I sat next to John. And we got chatting about things, and, and as you'll tell when, when John talks, he just, he's, he's uh, very low key. But uh, based on that, uh, that interaction, we developed a, a relationship, and that relationship to a large extent involved Peter and the development of, of teaching tech uh, materials and uh, a concept that is called gaming. And I'm gonna let John talk about that and what that means. But the impact of uh, John's ideas in uh, prodding Peter and myself to think about teaching in, in different ways and the effectiveness of teaching using all something that was quite different from what we had done and how we learned ourselves uh, has had a profound impact on you know, literally many, many thousands of Cornell students. So uh, as I, I can't thank John enough for what he's done for both Peter and myself. It's been uh, a great time. So it's uh, 30 some years, John, 35 years or so that we've been working together and, and John has come back graciously uh, almost every year to, uh, to give a talk to our our students in our design manufacturing class. So John, welcome. Thank you. I hate it when the audience starts with the applause. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, the use of technology, but I'm not going to use technology except uh, I did use a, a simple piece of old technology to produce some notes. <laughs> uh, I was delighted to be asked to speak. Jack uh, mentioned that you were going to have a retirement for Peter. Uh, I think he escaped to Singapore too rapidly to have this meeting before he left. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here today once again at Cornell. Uh, I started coming up here in 1948 when my brother 
uh, entered the uh, electrical engineering program. My father had been involved before that with the uh, mathematics faculty up here trying to figure out how the uh, weight is distributed on uh, the catenaries of uh, power transmission, which he was working on. Uh, so we have a long history of uh, our family here at Cornell, and uh, fortunately it, it's going to continue. Um, as Jack mentioned, I first met Peter in the early 1980s, and uh, uh, IBM had become concerned not only with the exchange rate and the, the cheaper production facilities in Japan, but uh, they were doing some rather interesting and innovative things that had to do with the manufacturing floor. And the system that they had developed was called Kanban. And uh, what it did basically was come to the understanding that relatively little of the time that the material spent on the factory floor was it actually being transformed and worked on. It was mostly sitting in queues. And part of the reason for that, and, and we, were, we were very behind on that, because we had a, a ratio of about uh, 20 to 1. 20 times sitting in queue and once being worked on. And the reason for that was as we transformed from manual operations to mechanized operations, the equipment was very, very expensive. It was replacing direct labor. And we wanted to optimize around the use of the equipment. So the greatest sin was when the equipment ran out of material. So we thought having big queues uh, in front of every workstation was a good thing. Uh, well, it's true that you don't want the equipment to run out of material, but you have to be a little more clever than that. And what you really want to do is to have the next piece of material arriving just as the piece being worked on moves on. So uh, what that does is that collapses the cycle time or the time it takes from when you put the raw material into the factory until the finished goods are ready to be shipped to the customer, which may be an internal customer. So we decided that uh, IBM needed more professionalism to be brought to bear on the uh, manufacturing part of our business. And we did a survey of universities around the country and we found that there were no graduate programs at that time that focused on manufacturing. So we, we decided to create our own graduate level program. Uh, and we formed a, an organization called MIT, MTI, the Manufacturing Technology Institute. 25 years prior to that, we had done exactly the same thing when we formed the Systems Research Institute because at that time uh, there were no computer science programs. Uh, that were at the universities. So we were in the computer business, so we had to have a way to educate the people who were developing our products and building them to, uh, to know how to do this. And subsequently that led to computer science programs in every university. So we, we started MTI and we put up a $50 million competitive grant to universities if they would move in the direction of having a graduate manufacturing systems engineering program. Or, uh, and there were 54 universities that uh, uh, turned in proposals for part of this $50 million grant company. And the grant was uh, divided between 25 universities, and one of the 25 was Cornell. 
and uh, encouraging to IBM was the fact that all the rest of those 54 universities subsequently, even though they didn't get any of the $50 million, they uh, uh, moved in the direction of having graduate programs that focused in one way or another on manufacturing. So as Jack said, he came down to uh, New York where our school had started in, in Manhattan on 42nd Street. We had a building there. We subsequently built a, a schoolhouse up in Westchester County and moved uh, the Systems Research Institute, the Manufacturing Technology Institute, the Quality Institute, because uh, there was at that time a great focus on quality and there were the Baldrige Awards that the, uh, that the uh, Congress had voted in. Uh, Baldrige was a Connecticut congressman. And uh, we subsequently had uh, uh, Moynihan come down and present us with one of the Baldrige Awards uh, to the Manufacturing Technology Institute. And that was a really nice nice thing for all of us. But uh, Jack came down, he came with Bill Street, who was the Dean of Engineering at Cornell at the time, and uh, Jack picked up very quickly on the idea that uh, we could work together and uh, do some, some different things. And as it turned out, both Peter and I were, were working on very much the same thing. Uh, I had developed a, a piece of the MTI program, which was a, one of the courses uh, that that program was made up of, and uh, it was the development of a learning game, which had to do with running an existing factory floor, and it was called the Manufacturing Operations Game, and Peter who was uh, very much interested in distribution systems, had developed a game called the distribution game. I think you called it, didn't you, Peter? So uh, immediately, uh, well, following the meeting with Jack, I came up to Cornell. I subsequently met Peter. We sat down, and five minutes later, we knew that we had the same kind of ideas about something that would apply technology to the learning process. So we started working together then, and uh, the three of us subsequently, uh, well, actually the thing that happened next, I believe, was uh, Jack and Peter started a program, a, a course called uh, 419, I think. Was 416. 416. The number was later changed to 5100. Yep. I don't know if that's more prestigious to have more digits in your <laughs> system there and nomenclature for your courses. But in, in any case, uh, uh, following that, collectively or individually and with other people, uh, the three of us developed over 20 learning games, uh, some of which were done to use here at Cornell in the course, I forget what it was called actually. Design of Manufacturing Systems. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we, we got to the point where we had uh, a lot more games that we had developed than would fit into that semester course. So Peter, who ran that course for many years and uh, was kind enough to invite me back every year for exactly 30 years, to uh, participate and uh, we continued to use that first game which was a very basic contextual experience in running a, a factory shop floor and making a product. Uh, so we used that as the introduction. It was a pretty simplistic game and then Peter and Jack subsequently added others of the games that they had worked on. And a number of these games were developed for uh, their customers outside of IBM. Jack had a uh, very successful relationship with a company called Aeroquip in Toledo, 
And uh, he and one of his colleagues from Michigan, Dennis Severance, uh, taught this course for several years. And they kindly invited me uh, on many occasions to come down and deliver the manufacturing operations game to their students there. Peter uh, uh, got a contract with General Motors through David Vanderveen. Van der Veen, who was an up-and-coming uh, operations young, researcher, young uh, executive in the company, and his career progressed quite a bit. I've a little lost track, and uh, Peter invited me to work with him, and I think together we did a couple of games for them. Three, did we do? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You must have been pretty busy, huh, Peter? <laughs> and then you subsequently did uh, more games after that. Uh, so Peter really took hold of the concept of using games in a mode that we came to call experiential learning. And I was very touched to turn on the television a few months ago and hear a primetime ad from one of these private companies that is a, a teaching company uh, touting their experiential learning programs. And uh, so the name has stuck in various places. Uh, of course, we thought at the time that this was pretty revolutionary and it wouldn't be a matter of weeks before the whole world was, was doing it, but uh, things don't change that rapidly. And uh, that's uh, particularly true in the academic world, I think. Uh, is that possible? No, it's unfortunately also true. Well, it's also true in the health world, in my view, because the physicians have tremendous amount of autonomy. And uh, there's a wonderful opportunity to make that part of our system a lot more efficient. And they are gradually moving in the direction of using uh, technology. And one of the latest things that I heard was uh, they have now taken, IBM has taken Watson, which you may remember was developed to beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy, which it did, uh, and is now applying it to the cancer research part of the medical system because it can uh, somehow reach out and grab the latest developments worldwide, uh, of which there is a tremendous amount of effort uh, in cancer research. And uh, that can be at the fingertips of all of the uh, physicians and surgeons who work in that part of the uh, medical system. So uh, that, that portends a, a very interesting expanded use of technology and uh, if we have time I'll talk a little bit about uh, an area that I think is very very ripe for the application of operations research. Uh, but I want to tell you just a little bit about the structure of a game. Uh, first of all uh, I'll use an example of uh, one that deals with the manufacturing floor because I'm, I'm most familiar with that. Uh, but it's true of most games in a general way that they uh, are focused on a simplified simulation of a, a work environment in a company. Now I have to explain a little bit why I say simplified simulation for a game. Uh, because uh, the, this game that we did initially and have used for a number of years uh, used a simplified product that related to one of uh, IBM's uh, products. It was a first level packaging. That is the, the platform on which a silicon chip would be placed, like a small circuit board. Uh, it was based on the generation of uh, semiconductor and packaging technology that followed the initial one 
that was the basis for the 360 line of computers. And the, the product in real life uh, made in East Fishville at the largest semiconductor company in the world at that time. And IBM in the early days was consuming 50% of the world's supply of semiconductors. Uh, now, semiconductors are everywhere. 50% of the automobile, I guess, in cost. Uh, so this package, first level packaging product was called MLC, multi-layer ceramic. It had a whole, instead of being a single layer ceramic, where there is virtually an XY set of wiring in a multi-layer ceramic, there are several circuits which are stacked up and there are through holes that uh, provide wiring so that it's actually a three-dimensional three circuit package. So you can imagine that's tremendously more complex in the packaging to hold what was single semiconductor chips to uh, multiple semiconductor chips, the next, the next generation. And you can see the, 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 not only the cost leverage, but the speed leverage, which comes with that as you know, computer technology advances. So we used, uh, we were emulating multi-layer ceramic, but we only used a single layer, and we called our game product a card panel. And uh, it only had 20 operations. Making a multi-layer ceramic, the real product, was nearly a thousand operations. Uh, so you have to simplify because trying to deal in a factory not only the problem of programming the simulation, but for the students, it's just too much redundancy and too confusing. And instead of having hundreds of part numbers, uh, different circuitry being manufactured on one production line, we only had two. And instead of producing tens of thousands per month, we only produced 1,500 per month. The numbers are large enough to, uh, for you to be able to see the, the movement of the material in the increases and decreases of the numbers that are result from measuring what's happening on the manufacturing floor. So you have to simplify the, uh, you have to make the game related to a real world environment because you're trying to give the students either a bridge from their academic learning to the real world or you're in the real world and you're trying to give them a broad view of what the actual work of running a very complex manufacturing system is like. So you don't try to encompass the whole system, all the distribution part of the, the thing. You, you focus on one part. So you have a game for the manufacturing floor. You have other games for distribution. You may have other games for reliability testing. Uh, you may have other games, which we did, for how does one develop, design, and build that factory floor to produce the new generation of products. So you take any part of a company, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a manufacturing company, the same would apply to a service company, although uh, there's been a lot more work done to apply this kind of learning and the vehicle of a game to deliver it to the manufacturing world rather than the service world. So there's a, there's a wonderful opportunity in the service world to do games that hasn't really been tapped yet. I don't know where, how that comes to uh, what you're doing out there in Singapore. But another thing is, the first iteration of game teaching that we were involved with here in OR and IE was a separate course where students would play several games over the course of a semester. 
Peter told me last night when we were talking that he's moving now in the direction which seems very logical to me of embedding an element of experiential learning using a game as the vehicle into the individual courses. So uh, that seems to be a very logical thing at the university point of view. Uh, as a matter of fact, even in the manufacturing point of view, instead of leaving your job on the factory floor and going to a class to learn about the factory floor, what we need to do is to take the games and make them a real decision-making tool connected to the factory floor so that the, uh, the work that the OR people are doing can get embedded in the decision simulation that would take the status of the factory floor, thousands of numbers, feed it directly into a Watson-like computer, and uh, using very smart and sophisticated algorithms rather than simplistic algorithms which can illustrate a point to real algorithms that can help you uh, exercise a whole bunch of decision options and then using the computer collapsing time and enabling a whole range of decisions the, the effect of a whole range of decisions uh, which would in some cases take years to play out in the real world collapse the time so that the people, the professionals and the managers running a complex system can try alternative decisions to improve performance or correct problems and can see what the results are strategically out in time, uh, they can make much better decisions doing that because it's not just stochastic, uh, although that's the methodology that you would use, but you're really creating a, a very realistic measurement that occurs in real life out in time. So there is a wonderful opportunity with uh, these, this kind of use of technology, I believe, for uh, a, an organization such as yours, which focuses mm -hmm. on the latest operation research techniques and get, getting them more directly embedded in the operation of a business. You see that the tremendous amount of time it took Jack over the course of his, most of his career to get those techniques for parts supply and repair and so forth embedded in the defense system here in the United States. So uh, there's a tremendous next generation opportunity for technology. But I've digressed a little bit because I want to go back now and talk about the structure of a game. I've already talked about how you need to simplify it from uh, hundreds of products to two part numbers or hundreds of part numbers to two part numbers from a thousand operations to 20 uh, and so forth, <laughs> simplifying it so that the students can get the full range of experience but one, they don't have the job of loading a lot of data into a computer and doing a lot of calculations themselves and having time move on. The computer takes care of that. The students uh, are organized in teams. They're again emulating the real world because the modern technology factories which are so large and so complex now require teams of people to deal with decision making uh, because the variables that relate to the problems are so broad you need the full range of engineering and scientific disciplines and we're now beginning to appreciate that you need the other dimensions as well you need the dimension of leadership if you're going to work in teams if you're going to just work in individuals it's simpler 
So these teams, which typically we've used teams of about uh, 12 to 15 people, seems to work for that preliminary game. Different sized teams for different games. Uh, and in the uh, 416 course, it wasn't at all unusual to have 90 students. So if you had uh, 15 uh, students per game and you had 90 students, that I think that's about six, six different teams. So it took Jack and myself and Peter, each running a couple of teams, to cover that experience. And Robin, Robin Roundy was in, involved in that also for some period of time. Weren't you, Robin? Yes, I was. Yeah. It was a blast. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the nice things about it is once you've got the game, the students are teaching themselves. So it's active learning as opposed to the passive learning, which is going on right here, where I'm talking <laughs> and you're just sitting there and, and hoping for the hour to end. <laughs> So it's active learning, so it automatically draws the students in. Now, interestingly enough, it's been my experience, I don't know whether uh, you and Jack share the same experience, but many times your average students, average in the academic world for great grades, uh, shine in this contextual world and sometimes the very top students very cerebral very bright uh, find it uh, cumbersome and difficult and strange to be working at such a shallow level uh, with a whole group of other people uh, so if that's true what that does is it provides a, a very good complement to the more traditional, rigorous, academic, lecture, classroom type of delivery. Uh, and it, it, it not only does that, of course, but if the games are based upon some real world environment, then it helps very much to bridge the gap from the classroom to the, the company, to the real workplace where you send them on to earn a living for the rest of their lives. Uh, so these teams are then organized hierarchically, you, just like a, a team in uh, any sort of team or committee would have a leader. So we have a leadership function. We usually have three people out of the 12. We have an engineering function, another three. Uh, we have a manufacturing function, uh, that represents the the job of manufacturing versus engineering, another three. And then we have a catch-all, which covers uh, production control, quality control, uh, information systems, and all the rest of it. So you have 12 people sitting around a room watching a screen. The screen is the factory floor, and the, the, the screen then you hit the go button and it gives you a problem. It says, oh, we have a problem. Now what kind of problems? Well, you try to represent the full range of typical problems that one encounters in any factory operation for sure. Uh, what are they, of course? And when we introduce this, we ask the students, well, what kind of problems are you going to run into? And they come up with all the problems, even though their experience is relatively little. Some of them, of course, have worked in the industry uh, and have a little hands-on experience about what it's like to be in that environment. But the, you know, the obvious one on a highly mechanized factory is a piece of equipment breaks down. So what happens then? The flow of material past that point stops the flow of material before that point keeps to build up a great big queue in front of the equipment and you have to find out what's wrong and fix the equipment. 
So those are the kind of problems that the students in, uh, encounter, and those problems are all preloaded in the game. The game uh, play is all absolutely fixed. And uh, if a problem is presented, typically you give them some alternative solutions. You don't require them to invent their own solutions because the game already has to uh, de have decided what are a possible range of solutions. Some of them good solutions, some of them bad. Uh, one is the best, one is the worst. And so the students get the problem and have certain options to fix the problem and then they are also fed manually other information that relates. So manufacturing would have a certain set of information and a, a certain uh, part of the commitment to try to fulfill. Engineering has a different job, production control a different job. So now you have these 12 to 15 people sitting in a room and they all are participating, all hear everything that's going on. So they're really working collectively and they make that incremental decision. And then uh, one person who sits in front of the computer, the computer where the game is embedded and uh, projected onto the screen, hits a go button and it moves on and maybe it encounters another problem and they fix that one, put a solution in or, or a decision in. Uh, and uh, then when they get to the end, they decide <coughs> okay, we're ready to move on, we have no more problems in this particular day of operation. Uh, the go button is hit, it goes on to the next day, it recalculates the movement of product through the floor in the standard way, interrupted by whatever sets of decisions have been made. Very simple, up it by 100, uh, take 10% off, whatever. And so they get a complete report that covers the three main parameters that they're measuring. Uh, production, in other words, how many did we produce at each part of the line? Then produce means they completed, they got inspected, they're okay to move on to the next operation. What is the work in process distribution in front, in, in, inside of each one of those parts of the line. And uh, what kind of yield did we get in that part of the line? <coughs> one set of information, which for each of these parameters has a plan and what's actually happened on this day, and another set of data on that one page report. And then they look at that collective data and try to understand what effect did my decision have. And this repeats down through a whole series. They play for one month, which is 20 days or, or uh, four or five day weeks in this case. And every day, these three parameters get scored. And now you've got six different teams playing exactly the same game in different classrooms, uh, facilitated by Peter, myself, Robin, Jack, any one of you could, could go in there tomorrow and, and run this game because you don't have to prepare lectures as long as you're a little familiar with the game. You can help them um, understand what happened for each decision that they made. And on top of that, you can reinforce whatever learning point you want to embed, which comes from all the other disciplines that you as a member of the faculty happen to be involved in. So this is how the game progresses and then at the end of two lab sessions for this simplistic game, uh, there's a final score and those three parameters get scored and weighted and you get one score. The game is designed for a group of students playing carefully uh, to be able to score high because it was always my belief that if the students don't score high, they discredit the experience. 
uh, if they score high, even though they don't score the highest, they believe that it was a legitimate experience and they're more likely to take away the points that were delivered and apply them in the real world. So that's basically how it works. Now the question is, what's the role of the teacher? It's much different. The teacher is not a lecturer, the teacher is a facilitator. The teacher does basically three things. They introduce the game by giving the students enough information so they know what the environment is like and what they're expected to do. And then you organize them and you run through a few screens to show them what the information system provides them. And uh, then you start them. You say, okay, it's yours. You sit down. And then after every successive day, when they're trying to understand what went wrong, which one of my decisions did I take to mess this, these numbers up? And uh, so you help them understand that, embed the learning, and uh, the system scores it. You don't have a lot of papers to score, which was <coughs> never a lot of fun for me. I don't know some of you that may be the, the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. No. <laughs> uh, so it's a, the role of the teacher is different. And it's pretty straightforward once you've got the game. Any of you could learn uh, in a matter of a couple of hours how to f go in a classroom and facilitate that game. Because there's no specific answer. You're just trying to help them have a good experience. Uh, now you might think that that's all well and good, but what if I had to design one of these games? Well, let me give you a couple of things. First of all, I've already told you that between the three of us, we developed over 20 games, either working together or separately or with other people uh, for using in the universities, for using in companies uh, as a uh, deliverable to a a consulting client, uh, and collectively we've delivered these broadly in the country and in fact all over the world to different companies and to uh, different universities. I've been to Singapore on three occasions and I've taught the manufacturing game there to both of the universities before the new one. <laughs> which is there's a technical university and then there's the national university. Uh, and I've, I've done it in Japan. And you guys have been all over the country and around the world doing this stuff as well. So uh, it's, it's possible to design these games. Now, when I design a game, I always have to get someone to do the coding. And uh, there's a ready supply. Uh, the students are so much better than I am uh, at coding because when I went to Cornell, in the six years I was here, I never even saw a computer. And uh, that was, you know, not that long ago. I mean, it's a better part of a lifetime. That's true. And, uh, I never saw a computer. Uh, so uh, just a couple of more points, and then I will have expended all the time between now and do we have lunch at 11? Do so we have another no, speaker? Break, break, break. We have a break. Oh, good. Okay, I won't make you late for the break. <laughs> so the question is, why do we need these games? Why do we need experiential learning, whether delivered at a university and or delivered as a part of a company learning program. On one hand, the companies, the gap between these two environments is moving apart. It's a bigger gap. So students coming out of, if you believe that, and I'll, I'll tell you why that gap is growing. Students coming out of your programs have a, a bigger gap 
before they really are up and running in the working world. Now fortunately, I understand still from Peter, about 20% of your engineering students are co-op students. So uh, that the university helps them get jobs on their off semesters. And so they get a lot of actual experience and that's very appropriate. But there's the other 80% who may not have very much experience in, in this world. They get out of school and it, they have to learn on their own or the company provides them some orientation type of learning to get up to speed. So I believe it's appropriate for universities to move more to fill that gap. There are a lot of things that have been done, but there are more things that needed to be done. Companies are obviously getting more complex. That's the fundamental problem. The products are becoming more complex. In the 1920s, uh, you could, as an option on your automobile, you could have a self-starter. Uh, you could have a heater. You could have a backup gear. And the windshield wiper was still the kind where you did this with the little handle that stuck inside the windshield. You couldn't press a button. You didn't have very good speeds on the windshield wipers and so forth. And that, that was not so long ago, less than 100 years. By the 1990s, 50% uh, of the cost of an automobile was in the technology, in the electronics. And uh, the function in in each generation of products throughout the whole spectrum of products uh, gets more complicated. More function, sometimes too much function. IBM uh, is guilty of having put too much function in to their systems, into their computers, because the engineers had such a predominant role and they would think of everything that they could put in it. And the marketing people were not well enough connected, so they weren't uh, very much uh, influencing the marketplace. And that, that's changed. Companies have now realized that the technology required to create products has moved away from the human beings that are using them, <coughs> that they have had to reach out and uh, grasp the marketplace. And uh, it's been pretty good progress in that area. Uh, so that, that's one dimension. Now patents, of course, are another telling example. Uh, back in the 1930s, if you looked at a patent, it had one, maybe two names on it. You get to the 1980s, you look at a patent, it has to have a whole team because you have to bring a whole lot of technical disciplines at least and maybe human disciplines as well in order to be able to invent something new that's patentable. So uh, if you just look at patents you see that it's getting more complex. The factory floor is getting more complex because you're moving through an evolution from manual factories to mechanized factories to highly automated factories, to roboticized factories. And in fact, most factories are still a combination of those things. So the fact that it's a combination is a complexity in, it, in itself. Uh, and the list goes on. And I think you're well aware, if you stop to think about it a little bit, that the, uh, the world of business is moving in the direction of more complexity. And the incremental decisions that they have to make, even though they require a large set of skills to deal with problems, they are fairly broad, the problems, but they're relatively shallow because these decisions, particularly say on a factory floor, have to be made pretty quickly. You can't go into a lot of depth, so if you had more tools readily at your disposal, you could go into more depth and you could do it, still do it quickly. So that's a challenge. Uh, in the university system, uh, 
I have challenges which you're all well aware of and I'm, I'm not so well aware of. So Peter has dealt with a lot of what I've talked about over the course of his career here at Cornell and now continuing at uh, in Singapore. Uh, and he has not only uh, been very much involved in delivering the, the game course that was here and developing the games for that course and for his clients, but he also uh, ran your systems engineering program for quite a number of years, didn't you, Peter? Five uh, years or so? Yeah, six, I think. Six years. Uh, but not only that, Peter created at uh, John's, at uh, Jack's, uh, uh, idea to have a summer symposium, which Peter and Jack designed. I participated in to some small degree, as I had left IBM by that time and gotten involved in Columbia and consulting business with some friends of mine and so forth. And my time became pretty limited in a hurry. Uh, so these symposiums, week-long symposiums, held it here at Cornell. Professors from other universities were invited to come in an attempt to share the experience using games and experiential learning. And I don't have any measure of how much of that took hold. I, you probably hear occasionally from some of those people and get bits and pieces. Uh, I've been to lots of universities and delivered that stuff, but I'm relatively disconnected from it. Uh, but in addition to that, Peter also taught games remotely as the program removed, moved in from students who were here on site to some set of students who were learning remotely, and we, we were doing that at IBM, and I was doing a lot of that teaching as well. Peter has actually facilitated the play of games remotely, so if you can get a team of professionals who take an evening to go back to school and take a course that contains a game uh, with Peter as the sponsor. Uh, he can sit in his office and facilitate their game play. So he's really uh, not only done all of those things at Cornell, but now he continues to do them out in Singapore. And I certainly hope to get out there, Peter, and see firsthand what you're doing. Uh, so I think I've covered everything except it wasn't all work with Peter and I, you know. Uh, we not only pursued OR subjects, but we pursued uh, FR subjects as well. Uh, that's food research. <laughs> we had breakfast together and we made a study of where could we buy the best breakfast uh, home fries. <laughs> and we knew the Roscoe Diner did pretty well on that, but the best ones uh, that we've discovered so far, and this study continues, <laughs> was in Flint, Michigan. Right, Peter? Uh, Peter is a, a very nice man. He's a, a devout, devout man. He's very human. I've been in his office many, many times and seen him interact with students. He's very generous with his time, very helpful to his students, uh, well recognized as a favorite teacher in your program here on many occasions. And uh, he and Nancy have raised a, a very fine family of uh, six children, four of whom are, are the homemade ones are here today. And the other two are out where they live in Ohio and West Virginia. So Peter, it's been my great pleasure to get to know you and work with you and uh, I wish you well. And I just want to give you one more thanks. My youngest grandson, Will Jenner, graduating from high school this year, came to Cornell with his father uh, some months ago, just before you left for Singapore. Uh, his father's also a graduate of Cornell, as, as is uh, my son's mother, who was a graduate of Cornell, and my brother before them. And now the grandson came here 
and you and Jack were very, very cordial to him and spent some time with him. And not only that, even though you said it probably wouldn't help him at all, you wrote very nice supporting letters which got attached to his application. And we thought uh, he was going to go to a small technical school, Harvey Mudd, or Ruth Hallman of Terre Haute, Indiana. But he finally decided he limited his choices down to Berkeley and Cornell, where he'd been accepted. And uh, I got a call a week ago from my son that said he's going to Cornell. Uh, he'll matriculate here in engineering in the fall, and uh, then he will go on to study computer science unless he changes his mind. Any of you have children who change their minds? <laughs> <laughs> but we are delighted because uh, we don't live that far. We'll get to see our youngest grandson uh, a lot, maybe even more than his parents, who knows. So thank you, Peter and Jack, for all of your help there. Well, thank you, John. I, again, it's hard. It's hard for you to uh, comprehend these gaming experiences unless you actually are participating in them. So normally, when Peter and, and John and I would get these, uh, start with this game that John described in some detail, these students would be very often they were uh, juniors or seniors, and if you think about the kind of education that has been provided to them up until this particular experience. It's all, you sit in the classroom, or at least almost all, you sit in the classroom, the professor talks with you, you go to labs, you whatever, and it's all focused on you and your individual learning. All of a sudden, they're stuck in an environment where there is no answer, necessarily. Uh, there are different opinions that different people have, they have different of views, of, as you pointed out with uh, the data. They have a measurement system that's flawed. They have all kinds of things. And, you're, and all of a sudden, the world isn't quite so simple as finding the derivative of something or solving a linear program or, or whatever. And as you mentioned, some of these people who may have not prospered, let's say, academically as much as others, are not phased by this at all. And this sort of uncertain environment uh, causes other ones to have uh, some uh, difficulty, shall we say. So it, uh, this whole way in which we taught, I, I must admit that when John first uh, told me about this, I was not convinced that this was a good idea. But, okay, we'll go, we'll try it. And uh, he was, I was kind of converted pretty quickly. It was a really, uh, and, and as, as you mentioned, we have a series of classes that we developed over time which uh, are, are heavily based on a sequence of, of a building of sequences of these gaming experiences to get certain points across and to uh, uh, make the more technical aspects of our education clear why you need to do what, what we've taught in other classes. So it's, uh, I guess, kind of overstate the importance of what you've done for us and, and the impact you've uh, had through all the things that, uh, you know, the way we thought about things and how our students, uh, you know, thousands of students uh, have taken these classes have benefited because of uh, these basic ideas that you put forth. So we, we thank you. And of course, Peter, <laughs> impossible to say how much Peter has contributed to the execution of all these games and the development of the software. That's, now, Peter's, Peter loves it write software for those of you who know him well. And uh, he just loves to do this kind of thing. And so it was a natural of uh, the, uh, the teaming of uh, teaching and developing and uh, executing and it was all fun. If Peter hadn't been around, we might have had a lot of interesting ideas. That's right. We never got ever together. <laughs> That's a fact. Again, John, thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah.